The Burkhausen criterion tells us that any circuit where the loop gain is less than one would likely be an amplifier, attenuator, or filter, but I'd like to concentrate on those particular cases where the loop gain is less than zero. We quite often see situations in circuits with negative feedback. For instance, two very common circuits using op amps have negative feedback. The standard configuration inverting amplifier uses negative feedback. I can tell that it's negative feedback because there's a minus sign in the loop. The standard configuration non-inverting amplifier also uses negative feedback. I can tell that it's negative feedback because there's a minus sign in its main loop. These circuits are not oscillators, they're filters. Let's pause and think for a moment why negative feedback was used in each of these two circuits. The gain of this circuit is given by negative R2 over R1. The gain is not dependent on the properties of the particular op amp being used. The gain of this circuit also depends only on the resistors and not on the peculiarities of the particular op amp being used. This is interesting because if I were to just use a single op amp, then the gain would be very high but unpredictable. If it were an ideal op amp, the gain would be infinite, but for the op amps that we typically purchase, the gain might be 100,000, it might be 10,000, it might be 150,000, we don't know. In each of these two amplifiers, we've used negative feedback in order to stabilize the gain. We've sacrificed gain for stability. There are three properties of negative feedback amplifiers that I would like to discuss in addition to the ability of negative feedback to stabilize the gain. The first property is that negative feedback makes the gain less sensitive to component deviation. Imagine that I've purchased a set of amplifiers, each with a nominal gain of A. Some of the amplifiers might not have a gain of A. They might have some other gain that's close to A, but not quite A. One of those other amplifiers might, for example, have a gain of alpha A, where alpha is some number that's close to one. The closer alpha is to one, the better the tolerance is for that particular component. Let's call A the nominal gain. Let's call alpha A the actual gain. If a component has a 1% tolerance, then alpha might be as large as 1.01. .01. If I take the actual gain and divide it by the nominal gain, I can find out how far off the gain might be in an actual circuit. It's very simple when we have just a single amplifier. Let's put that amplifier into a feedback loop. If I put amplifier A into a feedback loop, then my nominal gain is given by A divided by one minus A beta, and remember that A beta is negative. If I take a similar amplifier, but with a tolerance that causes it to deviate from the gain A, and put it into a feedback network, then I would get a different gain through the feedback network. Let's again take actual gain and divide it by the nominal gain to find out how the gain might vary as a result of the poor component tolerance. After some cancellation, we get a result. It turns out that this term is less than alpha. This is what we want. For instance, if alpha equals 1.01 .01 and A beta equals negative one, then this term ends up equaling 1.005. This is smaller than alpha, which was 1.01. .01. What this means is that if I have an amplifier with a component tolerance of 1%, and I take that amplifier and I put it into a feedback network, I can reduce the component tolerance to only 0.5%. A second useful property of negative feedback is that it can improve both input and output impedance. For example, assume that I have an amplifier that has a nominal gain of A without any feedback at all. This amplifier, if it's an op amp, would have a very high input impedance and a very low output impedance. However, both the input impedance and the output impedance can be improved by using negative feedback. What we can do is effectively sacrifice some of the high gain in order to improve the input or output impedance. For example, if I take a unity gain buffer, then it turns out that the input impedance will be increased by one plus whatever the nominal gain of the amplifier was. The output impedance will also be reduced by one plus whatever the nominal gain of that amplifier was. I'll derive these relationships in a subsequent video. For now, it's enough to know that negative feedback can improve input and output impedance. Thirdly, negative feedback can widen the operating bandwidth of an amplifier. In an amplifier, what we typically want 
is for the gain to be flat with respect to frequency. But this is usually not the situation. An amplifier will have a low frequency cutoff and a high frequency cutoff for various reasons, for parasitics at the high frequencies and for blocking capacitors at the low frequencies. We're always going to have a high pass side and a low pass side. Negative feedback can sacrifice some of the gain and widen the operating bandwidth. To show how this is done, let's look at both sides separately. Let's start with the low pass side. Let's call the overall gain of this low pass filter ALP. So this particular low pass filter also has gain built into it. We can use voltage division to find the transfer function. I can identify RC as the time constant or the period. Therefore, I found the transfer function of this low pass filter without feedback. Let's put that low pass filter into a feedback network. We've already calculated the transfer function for a feedback network in general. Let's call the overall gain AFB low pass. We've now found the transfer function with feedback. I can make some observations about this transfer function. Knowing that A beta is a negative number, the gain has been reduced. Furthermore, if I compare the transfer function on the left with the transfer function on the right, I can see that the period has changed. Because the period is reduced, the frequency is increased. Negative feedback has changed the position of the pole in this filter. We've sacrificed gain in order to improve the operating bandwidth. Let's take a look at the high pass side. Let's call the overall gain AHP. I can again use voltage division. I can again identify the period as RC, but this analysis works for other implementations of the high pass filter as well, not merely RC filters. We've thus determined the transfer function without feedback. Let's now put this filter into a feedback network and see what happens to the pole. We already know the formula for the gain of this feedback circuit. Let's call that gain AFBHP. We've now found this transfer function with feedback. Because A beta is a negative number, T is increased. This means that the frequency is reduced. We can see that we've sacrificed gain in order to widen the operating bandwidth of this particular amplifier. That happens when the feedback is negative. An interesting case occurs if we have positive feedback, but where the loop gain is less than one. In other words, it's not going to be an oscillator, but imagine that we have a loop gain that's between 0 and 1. In this case, the gain will increase and the operating bandwidth will be reduced. This can be useful sometimes. In an oscillator, we've brought the loop gain all the way to 1. But there are certain situations where one might want to have a higher quality factor in the filter. This type of feedback is called regenerative feedback. In the next video, we'll look at different types of negative feedback and how to identify them in circuits.